<clears throat> Our sister Eunice Lawson is going to have another treatment, cancer treatment, this coming Tuesday. We need to remember her in our prayers. Our brother Doug Coleman had triple bypass surgery this past week, and he is still in Pikeville Medical Center in the ICU. Uh, and he will probably be moved out of ICU this coming Monday to a regular room. We need to continue to remember Jay Williamson and his wife, Jean. Jay hopefully will be getting out of the hospital Monday. His wife, Jean, had cancer surgery this week and is very sore. We need to remember, too, Delilah and Jerry Roberts. Uh, Delilah's been having such a hard time. Need to remember the family of Whitney Thacker and her unborn baby car accident took both their lives. For our men, we're going to be having a meeting this coming Saturday here at the church building. We can space out, uh, speak loud, and still have our meeting. The meeting will be at 11 o'clock here at the church building. We need to discuss the opening back up on the 20th of our worship services. Thank God we are going to be able to meet back together beginning the 20th of this month here at the church building. Men, we need to have a meeting this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock. Discuss whether if we're going to have two services or how exactly we're going to be able to open, open back up. Let's begin our services with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this beautiful Sunday morning, the same day in which Your Son came out of that tomb to become our living Savior. We thank You for the blessings of life that You give us day by day, taking care of our needs and providing them, keeping us healthy. We thank You, Father, for the first day of the week and the privilege that Your children have to gather together to worship You, our God. We are thankful for Jesus, thankful for Him coming to this earth and giving Himself upon the cross that we might have that wonderful chance of life eternal. We beg of You, Father, to forgive us of our sins, realize our own human weaknesses. We don't always do what You want us to do. And Father, sometimes we may go beyond that which You have permitted us to do. We beg of You to forgive us. We're thankful for the precious blood of Jesus that washes those sins away. And Father, help us that we hold not grudges and that we forgive others who have trespassed against us. As we worship You this hour, Father, we pray that You'll accept our worship, that it will be done according to Your will, that spiritually we'll put ourselves totally into our worship to You. Thank You for prayer. Such a wonderful avenue of being able to talk to the Creator of the universe. And in the name of Jesus we pray, Amen. <clears throat> Six nine four. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. Six nine four in the book. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way, where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dim eyes where all is love and the soul never dies. Oh, roses bloom Spend 
eternity where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dies where all is love in the soul never dies. A love light beams across the foam where the soul never dies. It shines to light the shores of home where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dim dies. Where all is love and the soul never dies. My life will end in deathless sleep where the soul never dies and everlasting joys are reap where the soul never dies no sad farewells no tear dim dies where all is love and the soul never dies I'm on my way to that fair land where the soul never dies, where there will be no parting and, and the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dim dies, where Seven eight four. <clears throat> Why did my Savior come to earth? <clears throat> Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Be Till 
Jesus comes, I'll sing His praise, and then to glory go. something I've just never understood. I've talked with several folks and used to work with folks who really looked forward to Friday and Saturday night because they knew on Friday and Saturday night they'd be able to go to one of the bars where they attended and they'd be able to find somebody that they could get in a fight with. <laughs> and I just don't get it. We're probably all familiar with the phrases that have been made concerning fights. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. We've heard that old adage that somebody got his clock cleaned, that means that he'd been in a fight and somebody whipped him. I guess it's back around 1971, I, was, I, was, I had a motorcycle back then, and. I was riding down Main Street in Jackson, Ohio, my hometown. And as I was riding down the street, suddenly I saw something go whizzing by my head. And I could hear it hit the street and crash. Turned out it was a, probably a beer bottle. I stopped my motorcycle just to see what was going on, and two fellas had come out of a bar located there on Main Street. They were hitting each other. One of them would knock the other one down and then he would get back up and he'd smack the other one in the face. This went on for a short time and finally the two guys got up, put their arms around each other's shoulders and walked back in the bar. All I could think of was, man, how dumb. Tomorrow, when they finally sober up and come to, they're going to come to the realization that something bad happened the night before. I, I, just, I just don't understand fighting. But this morning, I want us to consider that there are people who find themselves fighting, not other people, but find themselves fighting against God. In order to bring us to our lesson today, I want us to come to the realization that the Bible does teach us very plainly that it is possible for a person to fight against God. In fact, if we turn to the book of Acts, chapter 5, if you have your Bibles there with you in the house, some of you might want to dust them off, open them up to Acts chapter 5. It is in Acts chapter 5 that we read in this wonderful book and in this wonderful chapter of a man named Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a famous Jewish rabbi who lived during the time that Jesus lived and the time that the Apostle Paul lived. Being a famous Jewish rabbi, he was also the leader of the Sanhedrin. And he was, of course, being in the Sanhedrin, a member of the Jewish highest court. Look at the way that Acts chapter 5 and verse 34 describes this man Gamaliel. It says that he was a Pharisee, a doctor of the law, and he was had in reputation among all the people. He was a powerful man. He was a man who was known as being high up in the 
religious authority of his day. The Apostle Paul got arrested. We read this in Acts chapter 22, 21 and 22. He was arrested in the temple area there at Jerusalem. But just on the back side of the temple in Jerusalem, there was the fortress of Antonia. The, the Roman government had built a fortress there for the housing of, it's been suggested, up to a thousand soldiers. The Apostle Paul was arrested when he was in the temple area, and in order to get to the fortress of Antonia, you had to climb up a set of stairs. And so they began climbing up the set of stairs with the Apostle Paul being arrested, and Paul requested the ability to stop on those stairs and to address the people who had had him arrested. Well, they gave Paul that privilege. The Bible says in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3 that Paul said these words. He said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. For Paul to say that he had been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, that, that means that he had been at the school of Gamaliel. He had been taught by Gamaliel. He had been trained by Gamaliel. And for Paul to say that he had been taught by Gamaliel would be like somebody today saying, well, I graduated from Harvard. Gamaliel was a significant man held in high esteem by his contemporaries. Well, we're going to go back to Acts chapter 5. We're going to find the power that was wielded by this man, Gamaliel, and we'll also get the opportunity to see the great wisdom that Gamaliel exhibited. It is in Acts chapter 5 that all the apostles have been arrested. Of course, Paul is... It is still Saul at that time and he has not been on the road to Damascus and he has not uh, been baptized. He's not a Christian. So he's, in Acts chapter 5, he's not, even, he's not even mentioned yet. But in Acts chapter 5, the apostles that were there had all been arrested. Why had they been arrested? Well, they'd been preaching a resurrected Jesus, Messiah. Peter, after being arrested, uses the opportunity to preach to the Sanhedrin who had had, him, who had, had all the apostles arrested. And when he preaches to these worldly powerful men, he tells them that they ought to be preaching about Christ because they ought to obey man rather, or God rather than man. Well, then he goes on and he tells that Jewish high court he says that you are guilty of crucifying Jesus, the Messiah, the one whom the Father sent to this world to save the world. Well, the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, upon hearing this, this unlearned and ignorant man, which is the way they described him, whenever they heard Peter, this unlearned and ignorant man, accuse them of crucifying the Messiah, the Sanhedrin members become enraged. And the Bible says they take counsel to slay the apostles. But now Gamaliel, that doctor of the law, that member of the Sanhedrin, he speaks up. And he tells his fellow Sanhedrin members, take care of what you do. Don't be hasty. In other words, he then reminds the Sanhedrin members of others who had arisen in the past. He says there was a man named Thutis. Thutis had 400 followers. But when Thutis died, his followers scattered and were brought to naught. He says then, following Thutis, there was a man by the name of Judas of Galilee, who had a great many people who began to follow him. But when, when he died, all of his followers were dispersed. 
Now considering these two examples that Gamaliel has just given, Gamaliel says this, and he says it in Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. He tells his fellow Sanhedrin members, he says, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or if this work be of men, it will come to naught. In other words, if, if, if Jesus was just a man and these men were following Him, since Jesus is dead, like happened in the case of the followers of Thutis and Judas, His followers are just going to fade away. But then He goes on, and he tells the Sanhedrin, he says, but if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Gabriel says you can't be found fighting against God. You know why you can't be found fighting against God? Because you're going to lose. Well, the Sanhedrin agreed with Gamaliel. They did have the apostles beaten. They told the apostles to no longer preach in the name of this Jesus of Nazareth. How did the apostles take that? Well, the Bible says that they rejoiced greatly insomuch as they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. What did they go on and do? Well, daily they went into the temple and house to house and they ceased not to preach and to teach Jesus Christ. But again, let's notice what Gamaliel said to the Sanhedrin. He said it's possible to fight against God. But may we never be found guilty of doing thus. Did you ever fight against God? You realize there are times when we fight against our Bible-taught conscience. We know what the Bible says about something, but we fail to do it or we do the opposite. When we are doing that, let me suggest that we're fighting against God. I'm sure we've all seen examples of that <clears throat> Individual who's tempted to do evil. You know, on one shoulder he's got the devil and the devil's telling him, go ahead and do it. You're going to get away with it. Nobody's going to know about it. It's not going to make any difference anyway. And on the other shoulder is that angel and the angel's saying, you know you shouldn't do this. You know that God doesn't want you to do this. We've all had fights like that within ourselves. Oftentimes, these fights within ourselves are also fights against God. This morning, I want us to consider for a little while just how man today can fight against God. Now, it's not an inclusive sermon. I'm not going to talk about every way. That would be an impossibility. We're just going to talk about a couple of them. Many of us can remember a time in our country when things were simpler. You didn't have to lock your doors at night. A man's word was his bond. If a man told you something, you could rely upon what he said. It was a time when the Bible was considered as being inspired and authoritative and unquestionable. Then the 60s hit, 1960s. And a lot of people decided, a lot of people here in our country anyway, decided it was time for a change. And, and no doubt some of the changes that were brought about during that period were, were decent changes. But some of the changes were absolutely devastating. There was a time whenever the main religious bodies of our country all agreed and believed that that which was written in 1 Timothy 2 was the truth and was to be obeyed. It's in that wonderful chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 2. You remember whenever Paul wrote to the church, that, whenever Paul 
wrote to the various churches, one of the things that he had to try to prove to these people time and again was that he was an apostle. He was not one of the original twelve, remember? And a lot of Christians doubted that he could be an apostle, but Paul had to prove to them that he was one born out of due time and therefore was, was indeed an apostle, one who had been chosen by God to be an apostle. And not only an apostle, he says, but also a preacher. He goes on in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. I want us to note something here. The word men or the word man is found many times in the Bible. From the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. Very often, whenever we see the word man or men, in the Word of God, it's the Greek word anthropos. Anthropos. Now, anthropos is one of those words that although it is translated as men, it means men and women. Anthropology, which comes from the word anthropos. Anthropology is a study of all sexes, men and women. In verse 8, we find, and we just read, the word men. I, I would therefore that men everywhere lift up holy hands without that wrath and doubt. That word there is not the word anthropos. It does not mean mankind, men and women. Rather, it is the word anar in the Greek, and it means the male sex. In other words, when Paul is speaking of positions of leadership in the church, when prayers are being led for the church, he says the man is the one that's to be doing the leading. He then goes on and talks about what one thing that women can do. He says by inspiration that a woman can show her Christianity not by the way that she's dressed in fancy clothes, that's modest apparel, but he says, rather, by good works. But I want us especially to note what the Bible commands in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. The inspired writer Paul says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority. Now that means to exercise dominion. So I'll tell you what, I'll read it again, and this side we'll put in exercise dominion. We usually don't use the word usurp today. He says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to exercise dominion over the man. Years ago, people read 1 Timothy 2.12 and they believed what it said. But then things changed. And things got complicated. Many of the mainline churches began to decide on their own that women deserved and needed to have a change in roles. Some of them began putting women into positions of deacons and then preachers and then elders of the church. Now that throws a real problem. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, we read that a bishop, an elder, He's known as a bishop, as an elder, as an overseer, as a pastor in the Bible. A bishop in 1 Timothy 3, 2 must, must be the husband of one wife. And that word husband there is that Greek word anar, which means the male sex. So you see, a female cannot be a husband because she's a female. She's not. That's just common sense out of the Bible, isn't it? Anyway, times changed. Women's roles changed. But you know what? Even though times changed and women's roles changed, the Bible remained the same. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. But women's roles did change. 
even among our own people. Even among churches of Christ, some have fallen off that precipice of liberalism and have begun putting women in positions unheard of in the early church, in the first century church, in the church that we ought to be following after their example today. You know, as I was studying for this lesson, I began to, I began to realize something. The churches that are doing this, can they still be called the Church of Christ? Would the Lord claim a church that's not doing as He commanded? Well, some people say Paul stressed the idea of men being over women in spiritual matters because it was the custom of His time. In other words, uh, 2,000 years ago, a woman was in this inferior, considered to be in an inferior position of leadership, so the man was the one who always was the one who took over that position. But the Holy Spirit goes ahead and tells us why Paul said what he did. Why that the man is to be in the leadership position. The Holy Spirit does this in 1 Timothy 2.13. He leads the Apostle Paul to write this. He says, For Adam was first formed, why did he say for Adam was first born? Well, because he says that, that, that the man is to be the one and the woman is not to be the teacher of the man, but the man the teacher of the woman. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Let's come to a conclusion. As long as we can truthfully say that Adam was made in creation before Eve, and we know that to be the truth, then we can truthfully say that the woman is not to take the spiritual leadership role over a man. Let me suggest that those who do violate this passage and have women as preachers or women as deacons or women as elders, you know what they're doing? They're fighting against God. I'll tell you another way that people fight against God. I'm really getting tired of hearing a fellow by the name of Franklin Graham riding on the coattail of his dad tell on television how a person can be saved by saying the sinner's prayer. I challenge that man or any man or, or any woman as far as that goes to show me one example. One example. J just one example of anybody in the New Testament during the Christian era of time who was saved by speaking, uttering, mentioning, or even thinking what could be described as a sinner's prayer. You know what? It's just not there. From the book of Matthew through the book of Revelation, not one example of an alien sinner obtaining salvation through prayer is found. Now, the people who will tell you about the sinner's prayer, they'll have a Bible in their hand. But I'll tell you what, just because you have a Bible in your hand doesn't mean a thing. Give you a simple example. How many times have you gone to a wedding ceremony? It could be any relative of yours or friend of yours. It makes no difference. You just you've gone to a wedding ceremony. Very often held in a church building, very often fancy. The preacher gets up and he's going to perform the ceremony for this man and woman, boy or girl, who want to be married. What's a preacher usually got in his hand? Got his Bible then. Now, what you don't know is that inside his Bible, he's got the wedding ceremony put in there. You know why he's got the wedding ceremony put in there? Because it's not here. <laughs> it, it's not. I, but, but it looks like when the preacher speaks the wedding ceremony, that, it, that it's coming right out of the Word of God. 
It's true that God created marriage. In the Garden of Eden, He made man, He made woman, and the Bible says that they became husband and wife. A marriage ceremony took place. God put them together as husband and wife. But if there was any type of actual ceremony performed, the Bible doesn't record it. Well, you know the ceremony. I, Jane Doe, take you, Joe Doe, to be my awfully, lawfully wedded husband. You see, the, the preacher's got his Bible in his hand whenever all these words are coming out of his mouth and you automatically think, well, that, that's coming from the Bible. But it doesn't. Just because a man has a Bible in his hand when he tells you that you need to speak the sinner's prayer doesn't mean a thing. As I said, not one time can it be found being used to save a soul. But you know what is found? I can give you ten examples just from the book of Acts alone of individuals who were saved. They were individuals who had been Jews. They were individuals who had been Gentiles. It doesn't matter. They all had to do the same thing in order to have their sins taken away, in order for them to be saved, in order for them to be Christians, in order for them to be added to the church of the Lord. Let me give you an example. Acts 2.38. There the Apostle Peter says these words. It's that first Gospel sermon that's ever been preached on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem. Peter says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now I know that false teachers are going to continually tell folks that all they need to do is believe in Jesus and say that sinner's prayer. But you know what they're doing whenever they say that? They're fighting against God. I'll tell you something else. If you fight against God, you're going to lose. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. You're going to lose eternal life. You're going to lose heaven. Thank you for listening to the lesson today. May we never be found fighting against God. We're going to have our communion. In order to help prepare our minds for the partaking of the communion, let me read a few verses. Jesus has been crucified. One of the male factors, remember there was one man on his right, one man on his left, who were also crucified at the same time. One of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, Save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Jesus, hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour. And there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. 
Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this was a righteous man. It's our privilege upon the first day of the week to be able to remember the suffering of Jesus by partaking of these simple emblems that Jesus himself chose to represent him. His body represented by the unleavened bread, his blood represented by the fruit of the vine. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we as your children have the privilege to remember our precious Lord and partake of these emblems. Father, as we partake of this unleavened bread, let us through the eye of faith look back to that cross and see our Savior giving Himself so that we could have life eternal. In His name we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, humbly we approach your throne to give you thanks for our Lord, for his sacrifice, and for his blood that we shed, that soul-cleansing, flowing blood. Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, realizing that our Lord chose it to represent his blood, we give you thanks, help our minds to go back and see Jesus as that spear pierced his side. In his name, amen. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him. 1 Corinthians 16, verses, verse 2. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I am looking forward to us being able to be together on the 20th as an assembled group of God's children worshiping Him. God take care of all of you. 